2000 to 2006. Triple H's reputation as the game had already made him one of the most notorious characters in WWE or oh, WWF history. JBL is up there. JBL is up there. Another underrated one too, King Booker. Let me tell you what. Got to give my King Booker credit. I was I hated that. And all oh, hell King Booker. I hated that, bro. I hated that. King Booker was a good ass or oh, was a good ass heel, bro. I'm what makes Triple H such a good heel was his attention to detail. Yes, at the end of the day, some people were fed up with his constant title reigns, but as a character, very few had the heel character down as well as the game. It was almost unfair. He already did a great job being the perpetrator of Austin getting run over and finding clever ways to steal the title, but 2000's Triple H had more in him. And this had to do with his positioning on the card. He was essentially the number one guy in WWE yeah, at some point, Mr. Triple Kennedy H had a cool yeah. element to him, no doubt about it. It would become more apparent after the Reign of Terror era, but Nine, Triple like, H is one of the main reasons I made this video. This man was absolutely diabolical, plotted a return with his friend before stabbing him in the back, all to become his good buddy after he was attacked in the parking lot. Damn! He emotion and worry over his friend, but that quickly changed when he was revealed to be the perpetrator. Triple H already established himself as a heel, but they went the extra mile to make him even more detestable. Then he loses his match with HBK and takes him out with a sledgehammer. He's all bloodied up and zero lessons learned. Okay, he hates HBK. Yeah, I ain't gonna lie, bro. Low key, low key, bro. We ain't really give nobody in here really gave that Triple H's credit. Triple H liked it, bro. As far as the heel, like that, dog. This is gonna make you hate him. Oh, you, you, you say you did? My, my, my bad, Vontae. Make he'll make you hate this shit out this bro, and then he put on a good ass wrestling match. Randy was punting and spacing out. It was magical. Had Triple H running in the house with a sledgehammer top tier. <laughs> Yo, dog, that nigga Triple H was cold, bro. This segment, I don't remember what this segment is. Okay, surely he doesn't continue this, right? Nope. This man played with a dead body at the funeral home, and it's strange saying it, let alone thinking of how WWE came up with this. What the Kind of confused as to how did they come to terms that this is the story. It just sounds bizarre. I don't know, but Triple H Six continued. He turned horror. racist for a month ago. Oh, yeah, he was racist. Dog. Hey, low key, Triple H, you a whole ass for not giving Booker this title. You a whole ass. Asking him for a towel to ride him in his limousine as a chauffeur. And it's almost a strange turn that his heel character took because the game wasn't known to be much of a racist beforehand. Even afterwards, with Evolution by his side, Triple H's behavior continued to develop. He put a bounty on Goldberg's head, which resulted in attempted murder, many attacks, and of course his ankle <laughs> being shattered by Batista. It gave Triple H a different depth to the other heels in the sense of, hey, I'm not gonna try killing him myself, I have money for that. Other heels would do it themselves. So he was shown to have a much more calculated view of how to reach his goals. Eugene was hated by most of the heels on the roster. They didn't like him, they didn't want anything to do with him, even Evolution. But Triple Fucking H Eugene. found a way to use him, and it was all about the coveted World Heavyweight Championship. Since Eugene was a big fan of Triple H, even stunning The Rock in this revelation, the game became his friend. It's for ulterior motives, of course, because 2004 Triple H was more selfish than prime Kobe Bryant on the court. And the amount of effort put into this charade was ridiculous. He could have won the title himself. Jumping in fun houses, making Eugene an honorary member of Evolution, and when this month-long plan didn't come together, he obliterated him and left him a bloody <laughs> heap. One of the worst beatdowns Triple H puts. Damn, look what he did to Eugene! That's saying something. The game took out William Regal in his hotel. Oh man, goddamn, he's showing a lot of blood, my bro. had this huge sense of pride after committing these actions. Like that image of Triple H standing in. This is this is all scripted. In front of the mirror with a smile on his. He'll beat the shit out of Eugene. Let me see what he did to Eugene. He screwed it up. Oh my god. Oh. Oh! His face is the perfect image to his heel run. A man who lacked morals, integrity, loyalty, and remorse. And this wasn't even the end of it. They After Randy Orton did the one thing the that hotel? Triple H couldn't, and that's beat Chris Benoit to become Yo, the world heavy. when he traded on Randy Orton, that was crazy. Weight champion, he took him out of the group, beat him senseless, and left him a bloody mess. Even though he had this. expectations of Orton surrendering the Randy belt Orton and taking back his place as- because he, because he won. Nigga, I remember it was something like this. And Batista slammed that on the ground, bro. As a member of Evolution, only for Orin to spit in his oh, as the belt afterwards. Oh, no, that's crazy. The game continued on as a regular heel. He finally did something huge by manipulating Batista into thinking JBL was out to get him, as this was a tactic to avoid the animal choosing his world title for a match at WrestleMania. It didn't work, though. He lost the title. So Triple H resorted to making Batista think there was friction between himself and Ric Flair. So Batista could associate himself with the Nature Boy again. But this was an elaborate setup to annihilate <laughs> Batista and challenge him to a Hell in a Cell match. He lost and disappeared for a bit. 
Upon his return the very first night, he almost killed Ric Flair out of pity. Triple H destroyed him with a sledgehammer, opened up his already fragile forehead, and threw him into the limo, all because he felt sad over what Flair had turned into. This version of Triple H was much more wiser. The other version had evolution and often felt more about them despite saying, his abilities ketchup, and storyline. Bro. From here, he was a casual dude. He did some stuff, but it doesn't stand out. Most importantly, Triple H was much more cooler here. He stopped wearing the suits often, leaned towards the sunglasses, and that because don't he was even look believable. in the main event scene, fans started cheering him. And after WrestleMania 22, plans were in place for a DX return. Now, as a kid, my memories of Triple H as a heel are towards his <laughs> late heel run. I didn't like him for faces. basic reasons, but there was a coolness about him that very few had on Raw at the time. There was other heels I hated more. Kane's already been the most diabolical wrestler that WWE Kane? had seen, but he lost his touch, not to mention had been a face for about two years. His yeah, bro, dog, Kane, Kane stopped putting fear in his hearts, bro, when he got big and slow, honestly, bro, like. Kane is underrated. Yo, Kane in, like, the 90s and shit like that, like, kind of fire, but also, too, like, I was too young to know how crazy Kane was. Like, you know what I'm saying? The Kane, I remember, I remember small parts of this, but bro, like, I remember the fat Kane, bro. That nigga trash. His masked run had run its course in management's eyes, and there was only one way to go, unmasking him. And this resulted in Kane being his trash. most dominant and most dangerous since 1998, I'd say. It really gives off shades of his run toward- But I ain't gonna lie though, that May 19th shit was crazy. That nigga, that nigga come around out, May 19th. And it was kind of crazy. WrestleMania 14 in the sense of you didn't know what he would do on a weekly basis and that's a very hard thing to do he burned because MVP? number one what? the fans have remember. to be interested in the tale and two they have to have a certain legitness about them. Kane within his first month tried to burn RVD, burn JR, tombstone Linda McMahon and choke slammed Eric Bischoff off the stage. This Damn. guy was going all out and felt like a movie villain with the way they were booking him. Then proceeds to electrocute Shane's balls because uh I don't, I don't know. He could have thrown him into the fire returning the favor but it was bizarre. This dude was very back and forth with the oh, threat no. as he buried his own brother alive because he became one of the And now you know what? I kind of take some of that back. When when they unmasked Kane, he was he was on some crazy timing. I forgot about that. This nigga was tripping. People. So he lost his edge. Kane's activities were mostly toned down until there was that story with Lita where he stalked her and she ended up pregnant. You fill in the dots. And ironically, this story was used as a catalyst to turn Kane face. WWE smoking on the finest crack with this one. Like, how the f <laughs> do you turn a vapist into a good guy in three months? But yeah, Kane's heel run was like a bright star that quickly runs out. He reverted to being a face again from here right up until 2008. His heel run here wasn't much other than, of course, him stalking Rey Mysterio and Kelly Kelly. He did kidnap Ranjin Singh. Yo, Kelly was Kelly was a hype back in the day. Kane. Kurt Angle's wrestling ability had made him into a legend of the game already for you. Amazing heel. Amazing heel. Kurt Angle will make you hate him, nigga. You hear me? Years into his WWE run. We don't say that often. Once Angle reverted to being a heel in early 2004, his motives were deceiving as Angle had proclaimed himself to be an American hero and a role model for the kids to strive for. His actions contradicted every single claim he made. Why? First of all, Angle took up the role of SmackDown General Manager. His role was to be unbiased and provide opportunities, but instead, he turned the show upside down, made Eddie Guerrero's life a living hell, screwed John Cena out of the United States Championship over an accident, and of course, his deep hatred for him. Angle was a fraud that posed as a noble man, and to top it all off, he cost Eddie Guerrero the title and in turn, exposed himself as healthy. But this was nothing. Angle from here on made demons look like angels. He shot Big Show with the tranquilizer dart and shaved his head, threatened Joy, and eventually used her to get under Big Show's skin, and of course decimated Shawn Michaels just to challenge him to a match at WrestleMania 21. And the victory at the show should have mellowed him out, but no, this man turned into a predator to fulfill his fantasies and straight up said he wanted to have bestiality sex with- Yo, the shit that he said about Booker T. wife, what made WWE think they can get this off? Your wife. It's gonna come home to daddy. Oh <laughs> no! Really, how he said it. It was crazy what they were doing with him because if they let go, I found Judy before you. Oh God, you love DMV niggas. Name five DMV niggas I fuck with like that. Name five. Y'all niggas only can name three. Maybe four. Trey loves Chicago. Katie Guap. Guap is eliminated. When you put Guap in the chat, put Guap the breedable one. You think I'm a fuck with a Guap the breedable one? What the fuck is you talking about? Guap M. Guap A. Juni. All right, bro. 
Go out play Chris next door. Chris next door, cool. I ain't gonna say I fuck with Chris next door. You're a cool nigga. I never met, bro. Just so, a little. He was getting. Look, y'all lost already. They get cheered. But yeah, Kurt Angle is one of the most insane heels from this era of WWE. And that's saying something. This mm -hmm. guy was a predator. He was a detestable human being. Everything. And they did all of this just to get him booed. It was so tough for Kurt Angle. Bradshaw's career trajectory is a very strange one. A singles wrestler doing yes. nothing ends up being paired with Ron Simmons to become one of the most entertaining tag teams yes. of the Yo, Attitude the Era. His time fire. runs out and it seems like he's heading towards retirement. But a huge opportunity opens with the departure of Brock Lesnar and the injuries to the likes of The Big Show and Kurt Angle. Enter JBL. JBL was an extension of Bradshaw's real life. He was an investor, a successful one at that, and WWE constructed a new character for him relating to that. Oh, I didn't know that he was really a successful investor for real. I know he had money, but okay. John Bradshaw Layfield was his new name, a successful businessman who left Texas for New York City and in turn became the very thing that his old character, the APA, would despise. A suit wearing egomaniac who loved hearing the sound of his voice. And compared to other heels, JBL wasn't as diabolical or flat out evil. He was more grounded and his immoral actions had this cleanness to them compared to the likes of Triple H and Kurt Angle. It was a standout character trait and showed that even his actions in the squared circle were white collar. Yes, he attacked his opponents, but he never usually left them bloody. He went to the US-Mexico border and went after some immigrants hopping the border. It's almost a crazy segment now. You wouldn't see this on national TV, but WWE in 2004 was wild. The Undertaker was a tough opponent, so he enlisted the help of Gangrel and Viscera and his Vistra, cabinet bro. cleaned up any problems that came his way. The real standout to JBL as a heel were his promos. He had this unusual contempt for the crowd and guys like John Cena and Rey Mysterio that you almost believe it's real. This man didn't have a single t-shirt. Now, I don't think anyone would have bought a JBL shirt anyways, but it goes to show that he was dedicated to simply being hated. No flashy stuff. Hey, he's pretty cool. Just yeah. business and pure hatred. Yeah. I hated JBL. This man was so unlikable. Man, I'm telling you, bro. I real life hated this nigga, bro. But he was that fucking good. This motherfucker. You're like, once you start to grow up and you just think about the rest of you hated, this nigga was fucking good, bro. Pop up when you least expect it. He had a big problem with the country of Mexico, and that would show in his feuds with Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio. This man told Ray straight to his... Nigga, I think they had like a bull rope match or something. Face, you're not a dog. You're a Mexican. Brought out Kane on May 19th of all days to face Rey Mysterio. And once he quit, he went to commentary where he'd endlessly bully other wrestlers. Upon his return to the squared circle, he was still the same guy. Forced Shawn Michaels to become his assistant what? and made his life a living hell before retiring. JBL was committed to the job. He had an old school vibe to him in the sense of do whatever it takes to be hated. And he went the extra mile every single time because that was his job. Nobody ever said JBL was cool. Yeah, he was cool in 2001. But as his cowboy hat suit wearing almost politician figure, nobody said that. Edge's injury in 2003 changed the trajectory of his mm -hmm. career entirely. Without that injury, a lot would be different. Not only in Edge's career, but the entire complexion of WWE. He came back significantly different and didn't have much support from the crowd. He lacked that fire he had in 2002, not to mention it was much slower in ring. So something had to give. And right when he turned heel, there was the whole lead on Matt Hardy situation, which gave... Yo, wasn't this a real-life situation that WWE decided to capitalize on? Oh, God, nigga, if a nigga fuck my bitch and then, like, my company or whoever I'm trying to work with, trying to make me work with them... Why fuck y'all niggas, boy? I don't play no shit like that, boy. But hey, boy, I ain't gonna lie. Niggas don't love they women enough because I ain't playing no fair games with nothing that none of that, nigga. If I love you, bitch, you cheat on me, I'm not gonna be kicking it with you and a nigga you cheated on me with. What the fuck are you talking about? Give him a lot of heat and hatred from the fans. And in turn, he used this fire to build momentum and become the rated R superstar. As the rated R superstar, Edge saw no boundary he'd pass if it would give him the WWE championship. He didn't care what others thought. Lita, he'd hand her to anybody if they could help him as a mere tag team partner. Snitsky, Big Show, even Vince. It was crazy. And what's even crazier is that this was the early parts to rated R Edge. This character would develop more and turn into the so most. So I get a check. Let me tell you what. It ain't no check. I won't say no check. I'm telling you, the check that they're going to have to give me literally wouldn't make sense for them to do it. And I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't even know if I'll take it. I swear to God. Bro, my pride, my pride is horrible. My pride is horrible. I swear to God. Bro, I'm going to be in these motherfuckers' faces. I'm, 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 I'm trying to be totally 100 with y'all. I don't think I'll be able to do it. And I know I might be stupid for that. I'm willing to accept it. But my pride won't let me. Bro, you're not finna be in my face. I don't care if it's pretending. None of that. Nigga think he in Mbappe. Fuck it, it's cool. 100K, not enough. I swear to God. Not enough. For me to sit and pretend to be funny and joke with somebody that... No, not enough. Not enough, I swear to God. 
Fuck probably give me the money. I mean, bro, some people got some people won't do some shit for money. I just that's just something I, I ain't on that. I'm cooler intelligent wrestler in the entire WWE. Edge was banging lead in the middle of the ring, destroying his opponents with a concerto. There was this pinfall, slept John Cena's dead in his own house, and he'd bend the rules like Man no Hardy other tried person it, but he got released video. because he wasn't DQ's going for it. Yeah, that shit title. weird. Brass Knuckles even claimed that he didn't want to wrestle in Arizona because they were the last state to recognize Yo, good night, dead boy. Luther King Day. This man was world class in excuses. He convinced Mr. Kennedy to put his money in a bank briefcase on the line not knowing what's to come, which was a cheap shot, a cheap attack, and he's the holder of the briefcase. Makes good <laughs> on the opportunity to become the champion on SmackDown. Edge found a lot of comfort as the champion on SmackDown. Yo, oh my God, managed. his relationship with Vicky was crazy. To get with Vicky Guerrero and even married her, all for his own interest. This guy would pull out some bizarre thing and always end up on top. He returns and gets a title shot during a title match and it works in his favor. Why? Because he's Edge, the ultimate opportunist. My most hated heel. This man ruined John Cena's life, cashed in on The Undertaker, and continuously screwed Batista out of the title. <laughs> and once he saw this Vicky Guerrero thing growing thin, he divorced her and said he never liked her. Ironically, this was <laughs> the most cheered he had been in about five years. There's very few that matched Young Vicky was fired. I've never seen Vicky Guerrero young. All these guys because of his style and vibe, which should work against him, of course. But he made it work because he had plenty of inspiration from the likes of Roddy Piper, the Matt Hardy incident, and a booking. He was always a coward that relied on unethical means to win the title. Hell, this man found two lookalikes to help him distract the Undertaker. Yo, ain't this Zack Ryder? And I forgot who this other nigga is. Just to win the title. This guy was reaching. I might be wrong. Towards the stars just to find any single way to win that title. It was crazy. Randy Orton had the perfect baseline for a heel. He was a second generation wrestler who felt entitled due to his father's success. And of course, his inclusion in the Evolution faction. Yo, I didn't know nothing about Cowboy Bob Orton. Watching Randy Orton made me look up Cowboy Bob Orton. I was like, bro, this nigga look trash. <laughs> now, also, I got to admit, this is Rails way before I was born, bro. So maybe he was really cold back in the day, but... Old school wrestling videos look fucking doo doo, nigga. I don't want to watch them hoes, bro. That shit look ass. Orin had the heel look down. A young talent who thought the world was his, and Orin did plenty. He disrespected legends such as Mick Foley, Harley Race, and even RKO the Fabulous Moolah. He had a hidden type of craziness that would unravel as the years would go by. It wasn't until he reverted in 2005 that things would change. For one, he RKO'd Stacey Keebler in order to focus on his match with the Undertaker Yo, the at WrestleMania. RKO Stacey and his feud with crazy. the dead man forced him to reveal his true nature. That of a pure psychopath. He burned a casket with a dead man in it and upon his return proceeded to drive a low rider in reverse and cause an explosion. That didn't work and after the humbling inside Hell in a Cell, Orin moved on to business like nothing happened. He tried to smear Eddie Guerrero's legacy saying he's in hell, rode his lowrider, and screwed Ray out of his title shot at WrestleMania. Not but all crazy. this was nothing compared to the next couple of years. Ray and RKO as a tag team had some diabolical moments. They basically killed Ric Flair here and took him out with a concerto, did it to DX, but once they went their separate ways, Randy Orton became even more cold and calculating. He brought out the punt, used it to take out plenty <laughs> of wrestlers, even John Cena's dead, and Orin needed this edge to finally get his hands on the WWE. The punt is one of the greatest wrestling decisions in a long time let me tell you why because it was it's such a hill move that shit is so disrespectful bro it's so fucking disrespectful i'm just kicking niggas in the head nigga WWE Championship, but keeping it required him to be persistent with this newfound attitude, and he learned the hard way. So upon his return from injury, a big emphasis was made on Orin's unstable side. He punted Mr. McMahon after having an argument with Stephanie, and from there, unhinged Randy Orton was here. He always showed remorse over his actions initially, but that would change. He did things with intent, such as DDTing Stephanie and kissing her in front of Triple H, yeah, taking that was him crazy. and Batista out with the punt, and then of course he had the bald look, which fit him well. He was having problems mentally, hearing voices, and he'd lash out on the likes of John Cena. This man was tortured and insane attempted murder with a pyro hell this man Randy would go after his own guys every you. once in a while the viper randy Orton was the most cold and frightening character of this time period because of how unpredictable he was in order made it work he had the talent to make this character a success and one thing to know is they had such great acting skills at this point he just knew how Who to do the, the worst team i don't know i don't honestly do i don't even want to pretend crazy. it's kind of funny how mr mcmahon was loki the most talented heel in the entire wwf the reason why i say loki is because he was hidden in plain sight mcmahon added a lot to the shows with his character and throughout the 2000s he showed why at one point, this man was cheered on Raw and hated on SmackDown like he was the Antichrist. He was constantly provoking Hulk. He was cheered on Raw and hated on SmackDown. I don't remember this time. Hulk Hogan and fired him all because of his personal animosity towards him. Started having problems with his daughter Stephanie over the show. Wanted to see Zach Gowan fill and use his prosthetic Yo, leg. Yo, him versus Zach Gowan is crazy. Get a mockery out of it. 
used Brock Lesnar in a trade to attack his daughter and to top it all off he had a match with her and no mercy knew that his soul was destined for hell and started telling tales of his demise <laughs> ahead of his Shit. buried alive match with the Undertaker that didn't happen though when McMahon disappeared Damn. he wasn't really involved with storylines until the end of 2005 when he targeted Shawn Michaels all for telling him to move on Thank from you. Montreal and this man was pressing him like why don't you go back to the old days the days of drugs and sex I'm changed Oh, well, you'll enter the Royal Rumble, but only if you Where's beat Insert Name. Tried to force him to retire, drugged his drink, and made him take a drug test, which flipped on its head. Went to church and tried to find his own religion. Made a match with <laughs> God as Shawn Michaels' tag team partner. Won that match. I remember that. Triple H didn't <laughs> want anything to do with him, and this led to the return of DX which drove McMahon crazy. Three months of hell. Sure, he had the upper hand at some points, but by the end of it, he realized it wasn't worth dealing with DX. After his embarrassment at WrestleMania 23, this led to a change of appearance from McMahon. He sported a do-rag and started annoying Bobby Lashley, and it was more comedy rather than some big bad. That shit is crazy racist, though. He put on a do-rag for Bobby Lashley, my nigga. Come on, bro. You wouldn't put no, no shit on your head for nobody else. You put on a do-rag to fuck with Bobby Lashley. And heel type of storyline. And Bobby Lashley bald as hell. It really led to the end of the Mr. McMahon character. Not to mention, it wasn't as insane as he used to be. CM Punk signing when with WWE caught some moments? people off guard. Like, and indie talent being scooped up by the biggest company around. And it's not like they didn't do this. It's just Punk's circumstances were significantly different than others. Like I never knew who the fuck CM Punk was before WWE uh, brought in ECW. That's around the time he came. I didn't know who he was. Boy, I quickly became a fan. Uh, became a fan. This nigga was nice as fuck, bro. Paul London and Brian Kendrick. Punk's initial days in the WWE were as a face. It wasn't until 2009 that he took the role of a heel. Punk was the direct opposite of what Jeff Hardy was all about, and it wasn't even hard for him to get booed. It's Jeff Hardy in the year of 2009. 2009 Jeff Hardy is like 2009 Lil Wayne. This guy was number one, but despite this, the Second City Saint went off the deep end with this new heel character and was so desperate to not only be hated, but to be considered the devil of WWE. Because of how much love Jeff Hardy had at the time and his own touch, it stood out. He was snarky, held himself to a higher esteem than the fans, and the difference to Punk with other heels was that he wouldn't be like, you guys are nothing. He would go on about personal life choices such as being sober, and these rants got him even more heat. Best of all, he got rid of Jeff Hardy and dropped him with a belt after his goodbye speech. <laughs> this man was absolute He even disguised himself as Hardy the following week, Yo, devastating some- that Jeff Hardy shit. <laughs> this whole ass nigga really dressed up as Jeff Hardy, bro. That nigga looks terrible, bro. <laughs> Some of the fans. Punk's status on the card fell a bit, but it allowed him to create what was known as the Straight Edge Society. Members had to completely devote themselves to Punk and abstain from drugs and alcohol. Punk had some heat, but the whole thing never developed to a story that would rival his feud with Jeff Hardy. I always thought there was a potential world title story there, but it is what it is. Luke Gallo, Serena shaved their heads, and Punk was all in. I was gone by this time. This big beard. I was gone by this time. He felt like he was almost a messiah like figure. The Straight Edge Society helped CM Punk become one of the most hated men on SmackDown, but once he caught momentum with it it was quickly taken out and disbanded punk didn't really have a long heel run in the 2000s but in the small time he was given he made the most out of it so that's why i decided to include him here because this man for literally three months pissed off every jeff hardy fan on earth they just hated him chris jericho's heel character in WWE oh man had chris jericho early on he was one of those mid-card heels but because he was pretty popular they turned him into a face king of my world jericho was a regular heel he didn't do something that was too heinous you know basic heel stuff he was leaning towards comedy at times 2005 had some moments where he was brutal with john cena but his real standout was 2008. Jericho transformed himself into a very composed and calm heel. He stood out easily because for one, he shed any mention of his Y2J persona and re-established himself despite not needing to. He needed to though because it was the only way he touched the main event scene. Chris Jericho was the deepest heel out there and WWE knew this. He wasn't the most violent or cruel, but he stood out because technically everything he was saying was true. It's just he was the wrong messenger. Jericho compared to the rest here looks pretty clean. I added him here because he was the most unique and had a big interest in remaining in character outside of the arena. He, he had, like, if I can remind, if I can, like, uh, compare him to something, Jericho was like a fucking fly. Like, when he was a heel, he was just, like, fucking, like, super annoying. <laughs> Nigga, he's be slapping niggas. You hear him, you can clearly hear what he's saying in the match. He, he got this little, this damn voice. He loud as shit. No. You ask most people, the best character of WWE in 2008, or the best heel, 
they're gonna say Chris Jericho. He just did some amazing work that year. In 09, he was great as well. 2010 and onwards. And he was right most of the time, but Mosquito just energy. because he was a heel, that made him wrong. Now, these guys weren't mentioned outright, but their actions certainly stood out. Heidenreich tried to destroy the Undertaker oh, crashing Lord. a car into him. That whole Michael Cole incident, which was crazy. Sean O'Hare was very different to others because instead... Yo, Sean O'Hare, I have not heard this name in so fucking long. Instead of doing these actions, he led others to that direction. Big Show swung a stretcher bound Rey Mysterio. Jesus stabbed John Cena on a club and stole chained and there's plenty of examples out there i didn't want to talk about comedy heels here as well because i just didn't think it was their place king booker he was very entertaining but he didn't fit the video much Shawn michaels is returning like 2002 that. as a proud baby face made things seem unlikely for a potential heel turn he came in as a heel with the nwo but it was nothing compared to his old days 2005 though opened things up michaels took up the role of a villain for his feud with hulk hogan and man little did i know he was really the hero of this situation Hit that nigga again. Oh man, this man was still as amazing as he once was. One month, he was a heel for only one month, yet people are still talking about it. Because HBK was making jokes about Hulk Hogan, mocking him, and even trolled the Montreal crowd into thinking Bret Hart was coming back. This guy had no chill, and it's crazy, one month, but he made the most out of it. It's kind of unfortunate that HBK never continued being a heel from here on, because he clearly showed that he still had the ability for it. But regardless, at the end of the day, this was a very memorable run, it certainly stands out, especially for a short run. All right, these are the heels of the 2000s. A lot of these guys were absolutely insane. The way they booked them was crazy, and this was all just to prevent some cheering. They wanted these guys to be booed 99% of the time. The best heel out of all these guys, I'd say, is Triple H. Man, sorry. Yo, the older I, I, that I got, especially now, I've kind of always been like this with movies. But it wasn't like this with wrestling. But with, with, with wrestling, I'm, I'm on this. I'm on this timing as well. Even though I don't watch wrestling at all, I root for the heels. Now in movies and TV shows and shit like that, bro, I be rooting for the bad guys and shit like that. I ain't gonna lie, bro. What, depending on it, like on Game of Thrones, I didn't root for the bad guys. I was rooting for Jon Snow and shit like that. But nigga, on certain shows, bro, if the if the bad guys is never winning, I will turn that shit off. Where JBL? They talked about JBL. They mentioned him. You missed it. Turn that shit off. You know, the bad guys never went, but turn that shit on. I don't want to see that shit, bro. That shit ass, bro. So, bro, the hills be the best niggas, bro. Them niggas be the most entertaining. They add the most. All these you want me to fucking chip for this nigga because he's Mr. Right, Mr. Perfect. He never doing anything right. Get the fuck out of here. Shit is trash. I think Triple H was the best booked as a character, not the stories or whatever i'm talking about his character, shows, his I'm telling you. the way he was booked was almost a tv show character he had the most background as well you know he was a part of the click dx and whatnot and he, he managed to make something out of himself but other than that all these guys did their job well. i said brock lesnar no these... brock lesnar not being here is crazy guys would be doing some stuff you would not see today at all you would not see the stuff at all all right what you guys think of the heels of the 2000s please comment down below in that's the first video make sure you hit the arcade no, yeah no, brock lesnar not being here is crazy